Um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of this very timely and important event. And um, um, during the brief time I have with you, I want to touch on uh, four topics. Um, I'd like to go a little bit talk about the human rights movement in Iran, its history, and why has it become really the soul and the essence of the green movement in Iran today. Uh, second, I was asked to briefly mention what do we do within our organization, what is our relationship and interactions with the Iranian human rights defenders, which would bring me to the current state of affairs, um, what is the situation of human rights in Iran at the moment. And uh, finally, I will close by talking about uh, what I think is the most important issue internationally with regard to Iran. What should the international community do with regard to the human rights crisis and the emergency in Iran? Um, now, it is uh, just like as uh, Ramin touched on uh, now, uh, the civil society and particularly the emphasis on the rights of the people, the rights of the individuals, more collectively what international law describes as human rights, have become such a force in the past decade in Iran. Um, I want to see why is that? Where did it come from? And why is it so powerful to be really overshadowing any kind of political ideology or other demands, which of course are part of the spectrum of the demands in Iran? Uh, but one thing I think no one can argue with is that the a search for um, respect for human rights is something that seems to be very much universally um, accepted within the movement in Iran and uh, from the top political leaders down to the grassroots organizers see that as the uh, outcome that they want to see regardless of whatever the political situation may develop into. Now, um, it, also that is a part of why the human rights movement in Iran is so much more vibrant and stronger than any other country in the region. Uh, we're really, you know, international human rights organizations who work in many countries, they have so many partners and colleagues in Iran they can depend on, whereas many other countries in the region, uh, there is a real deficiency with regard to that culture or that sense of um, uh, importance of human rights. Um, within their countries. So uh, to just say, when did the discourse of human rights in Iran start? We have to go back to 1970s, pretty much around the same time that internationally you get organizations like Amnesty International appear on the scene. Um, you also have several young, brave lawyers in Iran, um, including well-known Karim Lahiji, under the Shah, who take it up on themselves to defend political prisoners, in military tribunals that the Shah was putting on and executing um, some political prisoners around 1974. Um, that group of lawyers really brought the discourse of human rights into Iran, and um, even though it did not uh, have much access under the censorship and the repression that existed to develop fully, but it did play an important role up to the uh, time of the revolution, particularly in informing the outside world, in informing the media, informing the international public opinion. And uh, those of you who are old enough and have followed Iran, remember that just prior to the fall of the Shah in 1978, 1979, the issue of uh, the human rights violations in Iran, political prisoners and so on, uh, was starting to become a dominant um, feature of looking at Iran, something that uh, the regime, the uh, Shah's regime, had very much um, uh, uh, managed to keep out of the uh, international discourse. Uh, now, in 1978, 1979, when the revolution happened, uh, those lawyers, including Lahiji, played an important role in drafting the first uh, constitution of the republic, who was uh, not yet Islamic Republic and not yet included the rule of the supreme leader. Um, and some of those um, articles uh, remain within the current constitution and that was a very important contribution. Um, during the 1980s, just to first go over the developmental stages of the movement, um, we really don't have a civil society in Iran. Uh, there, it, it's really the dark ages. Um, their uh, countries engage in an eight-year brutal war with Iraq. 
and all the domestic institutions are shut down. There is huge political repression, and uh, many, many, many thousands. Up to this day, we don't know, but between 1980 and 1988, at least over 10,000 political executions took place in Iran and disappearances and a wave of exile of uh, many activists who could have become the core of a civil society. Uh, following the end of the war and the 1990s, the so-called reconstruction era, um, in the second half of 1990s, we see that a core of civil activists are coming together and starting to form various organizations. And then there is an acceleration after 1997 when uh, Khatami is elected to power. And actually, he consciously puts the formation of NGOs and civil society uh, within his uh, government's plans and does a lot in um, making their existence and their promotion and expansion possible. Um, he doesn't do much more for them, especially when they are the intelligence and security forces target them. Uh, but at least he did, uh, within his cabinet, make it possible for them to grow. So by early 2000, you start to hear of names like Shirin body who forms the Center for uh, Human Rights Defenders in Iran, which is a, a rejuvenation of the lawyers group back in 1970s. And they start to becoming a very active uh, human rights group. At the same time, in the early 2000, around 2003, we see an, uh, another major organization called Association for Defense of uh, Prisoners' Rights by Emad Din Baghi. Um, come to existence, and then suddenly there is this whole expansion uh, from 2003 to present of many, many new groups being formed and many people taking it upon themselves to call themselves human rights activists, human rights defender, and actually a good portion of them, a good percentage of them are, do, were, are doing research during this period, collecting information and learning what is the objective language of human rights advocacy and um, documentation. Uh, up to today. So uh, when we look back, what were the conceptual causes for this uh, expansion between 2000 and the present? And why has that become such a core principle? And again, the spirit of the Green Movement today, um, when I look back subjectively, I would uh, argue that there are two specific um, uh, developments in post-revolution that made the civil society so conscious of the importance of respecting the rights of the citizens. Uh, one I touched on is the, the horrible events of 1980s. Anyone who lived in Iran in the 1980s uh, remembers that it, it, there was not a family who, who somehow was not uh, did not include someone who was executed in prison on the run and uh, suffering from the repression, and on both sides. I mean, there was an armed struggle also going on by a guerrilla group that also took the lives of many people on the government side. Uh, but at the same time, just the experience of violence in the 1980s, particularly what happened to prisoners and activists, became a very, very heavy, um, had a very heavy impact on the national psychology, I would say, such that when the atmosphere opened up and by 1997-2000, people could um, look back and say, never again, the discourse of human rights became the vehicle for making sure that they do everything they can, that what happened in 1980s does not happen again. And I think that is also weighing very heavily on people's conscience today as we see the current developments go on. Uh, many of the actors who were involved in carrying out the 1980s killings and imprisonments are the ones that we see again at the home of the security and intelligence forces today, and that really frightens people. Uh, the second reason that the call for human rights became so powerful was what happened to the legal code of the country, what happened to the law after the revolution. Uh, right after the revolution, um, when it was again not yet Islamic Republic, one of the ways that the religious faction consolidated its power and moved very cleverly and quickly uh, was to draft laws and institute them into the legal system, particularly what became known as the Islamic Penal Code. Uh, at the time, it was really unthinkable that there would be such a regression 
uh, within the legal framework such as, such as punishments uh, like stoning or amputations would be brought into the law. But again,